can and should advance social justice and human rights. I'm really grateful to Instituto Ria for organizing this event in collaboration with Acción Técnica Social, Kikion Analytics, the Friedrich uh, Ebert Stiftung uh, Foundation, uh, Elementa, and the government of uh, Mexico. Last Thursday, at the opening of the 67th session, uh, Thursday morning, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights reminded us that uh, of the serious human rights consequences of the war on drugs and the importance of transformative approaches that put health and rights at the center of drug policy making. That is, of course, undeniably fundamental. And yet the war on drugs, it's not just structured around norms and policies um, and um, uh, yeah, norms and informal norms and policies, but also narratives, discourses, and media representations that contribute to the dehumanization of people who use drugs and other people associated with drug markets or profiled as being associated with drug markets. Which is why this event is a fantastic opportunity to consider how best to pursue redress and repair all also through these means. To support us in navigating this question, we have a wonderful panel of experts. I have, um, we have with us um, Gloria Miranda, a historian with an option in political science, master cum laude in peace building from the University of Los Andes with a specialization in economics and currently responsible for drug policy um, with the government of Colombia. Uh, Paula Aguirre, a lawyer with experience in human rights, transitional justice, and drug policy. Paula is the director of Elementa, the Elementa office in Colombia. We have Nuria Calzada um, from Kikion Analytics, who directs the drug policy work of Kikion Analytics, and has been active in harm and risk reduction for the last 20 years, and wrote a really helpful guide, and hopefully will tell us about it, on reporting on drugs. We also have with us uh, Dalel Perez, a sociologist with experience in Latin American studies who collaborates with Instituto RIA, a research and advocacy organization in Mexico, and I'm probably going to get this very wrong, Johan Viclian? Viclian. Viclian. <laughs> Sorry, I'm Venezuelan, Swedish, Nordic languages do not agree with me, uh, who, works, who works as a news reporter at the Swedish public service broadcasting company SVT, and who in 2022 released his debut book, We Will Never Surrender, How Sweden Lost the War on Drugs. We have a lot to get through and a little bit less time than before, so let's just dive into it, and I would, if the panel um, allows me, start with Paula, because Elementa has this wonderful detoxing narratives project that places destigmatization at its core and recently produced a report specifically on combating prejudice against women in relation to drugs. And it would be fantastic to hear a little bit more about the project, its intention, goals, and maybe, um, yeah, some of its achievements too. Thank you so much, Paula. Thank you, Juan. Buenos dias a todas y todos. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much to everyone uh, who is with us today. I'm very happy to speaking on this topic in the CNG and in such a good company. So, um, what is Desintoxicando narratives or detoxifying narratives. In Elementa, we identified that the war strategy, strategy that defines politics has had an impact on the narratives of the media to communicate about the causes and the effects on the drug policy. In this sense, the media have played a key role on the construction of discourses loaded uh, with myths, stigma, and disregard for scientific evidence. In producer countries, like my country, Colombia, uh, where the illicit drug market also economically fueled the internal conflict, the narratives inserted in the national media have validated the strategies implemented by prohibitionism, which in addition to being ineffective, have had a negative impact on the lives of thousands of people. So from Elementa, with the support of FESCOL, we want to contribute to this need to change through less intoxicando narratives, detoxifying narratives. A whole project that proposes to leave behind the dynamics that harm the public debate and suggest a different way of dealing uh, with information on drug policy in the media. 
let me tell you that when we started the project a couple of years ago, we started doing a great first review of news, publications, press releases, opinion columns, and practically our eyes and ears were bleeding <laughs> with what, what we were uh, reading and listening to. So a project that was designed to people in media found that absolutely everyone has to detoxify narratives. Public employees, Congress people, academia, and even the civil society. And that is how this project has become a huge effort to reach as many people as possible. And if you go to our social networks or to our website, you will find that we constantly update the information we put alerts when we find toxic narratives, and most importantly, we do pedagogy. Because finally, we do not believe that it is possible to simply point out we, that if we do not, uh, if, if we, we find that it's not a good practice, uh, we want to show how it's the good right to do it. Um, speaking of examples, I'd like to give you two. One that explains why we all need to detox narratives, and one that shows an excellent practice. First, we follow very carefully the legislative debates on drug policy, and in Colombia, it is very common to talk about drug policy in Congress. In a debate on the regulation use uh, of the uh, cannabis, a, con a Congresswoman began to talk about <coughs> cocaine cultivation. Not coca crops, but cocaine crops. <laughs> And of course, it was not ignorance of her part. She wanted to misinform and criminalize from her speech. And of course, she succeeded, because that was the headline of the next day's news. Second, as a good practice, Colombia's new drug policy deserves a good recognition, which not only mentions the negative effect that prohibition has had on the most vulnerable populations, but also includes a cross-cutting axis in all actions of the national and international drug policy of Colombia that aims to change narratives to build a different view of drugs under the need to implement a new change of approach. Thanks. Thank you so much for that presentation, Paula. There's already so much in there that we can unpick during the questions. Um, I take in particular what you were saying about the responsibility that we all have, including civil society, to contribute to this effort of detoxifying uh, narratives. And I know, Nuria, for example, you've been uh, throughout the world interviewing people, um, both in civil society and not, um, people resisting the war on drugs, and very often talking about, um, uh, well, straddling this world between sort of being an advocate and being a journalist and providing a platform for advocates um, also. It'd be fantastic to hear about that experience and your insights from it. Thank you so much. So, uh, Zara, you put the slides? Yes. Okay, thank you for inviting me to participate in this panel about media and drugs. This is a topic that uh, I, I am passionate about, about it, and I am working with journalists for two decades, and also I was, for this, I was coordinating a guide for journalists in 2022. So let's see a few insights about that. Next slide. Uh, just a moment so we can share it on, on Zoom as well. Oh, thank you so much. Technology, <laughs> a hybrid events. <laughs> ah, perfect. Okay, so this is the concept cloud associated with the word drug in a group of students from the Barcelona University. And as you can see, the collective imaginary is uh, even among uh, young people is filled with negative terms like problems, addiction, or dependence. Next slide. As Paula said, the perception of the society towards the people, toward drugs and the people that, that take it, uh, as on any subject, is largely, largely determined by the content and magnitude of its media coverage. 
But what is this coverage uh, like? Next. To answer this question, uh, who better than the journalists themselves to know what they think about drugs and in the media and why they, be they believe it's so. So the first, um, the first conclusion is all the journalists, without, any, without exception, agree that drug information is a disaster. And they highlight things like uh, is misinformed, is superficial, is sensationalist, uh, moralist, and stigmatizing. And they say things like that. And uh, let's, let's say that the situation is so, so terrible that uh, some of the journalists even mentioned that they were ashamed to be part of the collective. Uh, when we ask them why they think uh, it's so, they mention structural causes and also personal factors. Among the uh, structural causes, we find the media's own dynamics, such as immediacy, uh, or the increasing precarity of the sector, which results in a lack of specialists. Um, regarding the personal factors, they mention things like uh, the lack of knowledge and uh, lack of interest, that also results in a lack of specialists, the abuse of police sources, and the fear of dissenting uh, from the hegemonic discourse, among others. So, actually, little has changed in a century. And if in 1940 we have the New York Times, uh, we could read uh, that cocaine turned black men into unique murders better shooters and more resistant to bullets. Today, we have uh, exotic drugs uh, capable of turning you into a cannibal, in a zombie, or as resistant to bullets, to bullets as a, the incredible hulk. So uh, this intoxicated discourse is not only present in the news, uh, but is reproduced in every cultural expression like music, cinema, TV, or uh, prevention companies. Uh, stories about drugs often portray them um, as instantly addictive, impossible to resist, and surely bringing violence, madness, or economic and social ruin. How is this association created, even if it's not true? <coughs> so let's, let's not forget that the war on drugs, like any war, uses propaganda as a tool for manipulation. In the last century, we had the Motion Picture Production Code, or more commonly known as the Highest Code, uh, what was a document that established a series of rules uh, to control what could or could not appear uh, in the movies. So they have two lists, the Don't Do List and Be Careful List. And in the uh, Don't Do List, uh, appear things like uh, you, call, you, you cannot show the um, clandestine trafficking of, of drugs, along with things like the white slavery or the relationships between black and white. This is a picture of the 1940s, the, like it's like a satiric, um, sat satirically mocks about uh, this code. But uh, time passes, but the drug war continues, and the tools for manipulation and propaganda evolve and become more subtle. Uh, for instance, in 2000, a multi-million dollar deal between the US, the US government uh, with the seven major TV networks was uncovered. The, pur the purpose was to include anti-drug messages in TV programming. Neither producers, writers nor actors we were aware and sometimes in, involve altering scripts to align with the desired di direction. This arrangement allowed popular shows like this to incorporate uh, anti-drug plots in exchange for government advertising subsidies. And what is the impact of all of that? Uh, well, I wanted to include uh, this news because it mentions uh, Desechables, Disposables in the headline. 
and I still remember the profound impact that had on me the first time I traveled to Colombia, and I learned the use of this term to refer to the people that is struggling with the problems in the street. So, um, because at the end, what kind, uh, what policies are we going to allocate for people, uh, to disposable people, uh, who are not even resicable? These type of languages, the images that are usually used to illustrate the news and the content in itself, reinforce the stigma and criminalization toward people who use drugs and at the same time have a strong impact in the, on the collective imaginary that generates fear and rejection toward people who use drugs. Actually, I had to pixelate the faces of the people who appear in the forefront because it seems that they even don't deserve the right of the privacy but also has impact in the policies. Um, this study evaluated the impact that media coverage uh, of some substances had on legal changes. Media coverage related to these substances was compiled and the percentage uh, that related them to bizarre behaviors. And they saw, next, and they saw in the case of these two substances, uh, that legislative change is adopted just when there uh, is the greater uh, media coverage. That is, political decisions are made by media uh, and social pressure and are not driven uh, by evidence. Uh, we must consider whether this strategy, far from keeping away people, uh, population away from drugs, was the, uh, has the opposite, next slide, mm, the opposite uh, effect. For instance, it's interesting to observe Google Trends to know what volume of people search of certain words and related it to news. If we look at the case of methadone in the UK, we see that the, when a news story appears, in the media, the volume of searches increases. And if we look how many people is searching by methadone, we also see certain correlation. Uh, and moreover, the highest volume coincides with the announcement of each prohibition. So data that although is not scientific, it offers us uh, data for reflection. So in any, in any case, uh, for all the reasons uh, mentioned, it's important to change the narratives. And fortunately, in recent years, fantastic, uh, fantastic initiatives are appearing, like Nice People Take Drugs by release in the UK, or High Humans in the Netherlands is a platform that offers the opportunity to be open and honest about uh, the drug use, so helps to make visible another realities or this Norwegian campaign that is not only great for its harm reduction content, but also, next, but also uh, for where it's located, as you can see, in public spaces, so it's visible to the entire population. And also, the next, also uh, previous, also is fantastic for its image. So when I, I am talking with, uh, students in the university talking about this campaign, I always ask them, Do, have you seen ever a heroin user like this one? And all the room says, no, <laughs> you cannot see people, heroin users like that. So uh, beyond campaigns, we need movies, we need documentaries, we need mm, books, music, whatever cultural expression. Uh, that show another narrative, and in this sense, I want to sh I want to end with Sibaritins, the art of pleasure, is a documentary about clubbing in in Berlin. It's not public uh, still, but I want to show as an example that another narrative is possible. Substances do help enhance an experience. It makes me enjoy the music more. The lights are more like saturated or trippy or socializing as well. Some drugs that just make me way more talkative, but maybe talk a bit more interesting things or just find it easier to connect with people.
I need something to put my jewelry in. my approach to drugs even today is like this no i don't take drugs to escape reality or anything i just want to enhance the environment there's a minute about this documentary showing another narrative and uh, this person is saying something is changing they no longer call me fucking junkie, but an injectable drug user. So a change is going to come. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nuria, for another rich presentation on how um, representations, imagery can contribute to stigma and dehumanization, and the kinds of possibilities when we start sort of departing um, from the mainstream uh, approaches to how to narrate drugs, um, I would say epistemic approaches on how to narrate drugs. And we're really lucky in the panel to have another person who has ample experience in journalism, Yvonne. Um, and it would be really interesting to see, perhaps from an insider's perspective, behind um, press rooms and um, edition rooms, um, how that experience is also lived and um, how you've sort of navigated moving away from um, that mainstream hegemonic approach that Nuria was um, discussing too. Thank you so much. Really interesting. Uh, thank you, Sarah and Instituto Ria for inviting me. Really nice to be here. Uh, I want to give you a quick background to my journey as a drug reporter and also explain why I think this job is really important and what the future might bring. Uh, the subject is universal, but my focus will be Sweden here, okay? So in short, two different developments sparked my interest, my professional interest in this subject. First, while working as a science reporter uh, for the Swedish uh, public service broadcasting company, SVT, I became more and more aware of the lack of evidence-based treatment for people that use drugs. It was obvious that harm reduction policies that other countries accepted were not, and historically had not been, spread in a proper manner. Talking to experts and reading up on the history of Swedish drug policy, it was obvious that morals had triumphed over practical and theoretical knowledge. The second thing was cannabis reform. When this started to happen for real around 2012, I decided that this was something I had to follow. It was obvious that this was going to shake up a world where prohibition had been king for so long. But as a news reporter, uh, you can never go deep enough to make people really understand the subject. Especially in Sweden, where I would argue that the knowledge about illegal drugs is extremely low, while feelings about the same subject can be equally fiery. Where Swedes are usually rational and calm, when drugs are discussed, rationality seems very distant and emotions get the upper hand, as one of many outsiders studying the Swedish drug policy once noted. This was also something I noticed early, and it intrigued me. Uh, the drug discussion had a tendency to make smart people dumb and make usually calm people very emotional. Uh, that's why I decided I needed to go back and not only tell uh, the story about Swedish drug policy, but also tell the story about why Swedes acted the way they did. And this demanded a book. That forced me to go much deeper than I had previously done as a news reporter. Something that also gave me freedom and confidence to really start to ask the tough questions and also call out bullshit while still maintaining my journalistic integrity. I also wanted to spread knowledge about this subject to other journalists. This was really important to me. And the last chapter of my book is called The Big Betrayal, A Manual in Drug Reporting. I wanted to instigate the discussion about things like why we as reporters should not let the police be the only source in a drug story, but also about different uh, words that could be too political or stigmatizing. Discussions that hopefully, in the long run, can make us better. In some ways, though, I'm a bit pessimistic. Both drugs and crime are heavily discussed in Sweden at the moment. But does it lead to a drug policy debate? No. Instead, when the subject is being debated, the focus, as usual, is put on users. 
Stop using drugs is the message. A very, very simplistic slogan to combat a very, very complex problem. Although one with a long history in Sweden. The official police slogan in the 80s and early 90s, for example, was simply, it must be hard to be an addict. And the roots grow even deeper. The driving philosophy behind the Swedish vision about the drug-free society decided in the 80s was that drug supply was secondary and demand was everything. The user was both the problem and the solution, which in 1988 led to the criminalization of the use of illegal drugs, a law that still is in place today. But Sweden is not an isolated island anymore. Around us, things are happening at a rapid pace. In a world where prohibition has been king, people are exploring alternatives. We see countries experiment with different cannabis policies. We see politicians talking about regulating other drugs, such as cocaine. We see the topic of safe supply being discussed to combat the overdose crisis. Complex issues that cut through serious subjects like, subjects like human rights, health, and security. And they deserve to be taken seriously. And that's why it's more important than ever to not only have knowledgeable journalists, but to have ones that really understand that prohibition is not a natural law. Not because you believe that legalization is better, uh, but because if you are not open to exploring different alternatives, you are not unbiased. You're not doing your job. In a live radio interview right after my book came out, I got a question that read something like this. Is it a drug liberal book? Are you a drug liberal? My answer to that was, of course, no. It's a drug neutral book, and I'm a drug neutral journalist. And this should be the starting point, I think. The very least we as journalists can do to give a more fair and balanced view on this serious and complex problem. Thank you. I think I will think for a while about this idea of being drug neutral. We're so used not to find um, a sense of objectiveness in the media. Um, where those of us, uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm saying that from a journalistic of course. Uh, uh, perspective, uh, not as as an activist or something. It's so rare to yeah. find even in like the sense of object objectiveness that we tend to ascribe and understand as being basic to media reporting. It sort of yeah. feels suspended when it comes to yeah um, that, that's, policy. That's why I also I have felt a lot of shame. Mm. About. Thank you again, uh, yeah. Johan. We also heard earlier from Paula about like the role that civil society organizations can play in terms of sort of accountability for those media narratives, and I find it really interesting. But um, Paula touched upon this, and I'm hoping the lab will expand on it. The role of civil society, not only as sort of pursuing accountability in relation to media narratives, but also as educators in relation to media narratives, and very often media narratives or um, topics of discussion that should be uh, topics of public discussion um, that are quite complex and quite intersectional and Instituto Ria does a fantastic job at sort of um, engaging with difficult topics with a lot of um, honesty and clarity and it'd be great to hear a little bit about your experience with that, Lila. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. And thank you, all of you, for being here this morning. Um, <clears throat> I just have some support pictures there, so I can start without it. Um, with drugs, there's only two possible paths, prison or the graveyard, is what you see on billboards around Mexico. On the radio, you might hear drugs kill, or you'll be hooked from the first time. This campaign comes from Mexico's Secretary of Public Education and includes resources for teachers to educate the youth about drugs. Not only they use inaccurate and exaggerated information, like you start dying as soon as you try it, but the campaign also includes a stigmatizing visual language. It portrays brown and poor people's lives being ruined by drugs. Stigmatizing narratives on drug use with certain demographics can perpetuate harmful stereotypes and further marginalize already <coughs> vulnerable communities. Such campaigns aim to deter young people from engaging in drug use. While delaying the age of first consumption is an actual goal from a harm reduction approach, 
the effectiveness of these campaigns is questionable, particularly when they rely on fear tactics. Moreover, presenting exaggerated or inaccurate information undermines the credibility on the, of the message and makes the audience not believe future messages. Um, teachers have not been sensitized um, to drug use. They reproduce their own stereotypes to students who already have complete access to information on the internet. We know that responsible use of psychoactive psychoactive substances exist, and according to UNODC data, this is the majority of users. We know that drug policies do more harm than substances, and we believe that policy reforms with social justice can, can form part of peace building processes. A more effective approach to drug education would involve providing accurate information about the risks of drug use alongside promoting positive alternatives and support services for those struggling. From civil society, we've been able to facilitate open and non-judgmental <coughs> discussions about drug use, focusing on harm reduction, support and pleasure, rather than fear and stigma. In Instituto RIA, we designed a campaign on sexuality and drugs. We address topics such as chemsex and sexual consent in drug use settings enabling honest conversation regarding actual experiences and honest and, qu sorry, and questions people might have. Through this initiative, we emphasize self-care strategies, acknowledge, acknowledging that pleasurable drug use exists, and people can have positive experiences while reducing risks associated. What is not named doesn't exist. Women who use drugs are hidden behind silence and multiple stigmas for being a woman or a caretaker who also, who also uses drugs. Studies about the effects on women's bodies during different life cycles, such menstruation, pregnancy, breastfeeding, or menopause, are required and urgent. Women don't have access to accurate scientific studies to make an informed decision or recognize use patterns or effects that differ from men's. In our campaign, Women Who Use Drugs, we compiled and shared information about the implications of being stigmatized and ostracized. The social and safety risks we face, such as sexual assault and women's needs in harm reduction interventions or treatment facilities, as well as how consumption can impact or not during periods of breastfeeding. This campaign was launched because the majority of women on our social media channels requested non-judgmental non information on these topics. Women rely on anecdotes and advice from others because of the lack of research, and there is so much to be shared by women that has been kept on the dark. Having a small amount of stigma-free information indicates the necessity to include women who use drugs to design gender-specific programs and public policies. By listening and sharing common experiences on drug use, we can work from a place of empathy and compassion instead of stigma and criminalization. The former push people away from services and make people lack trust in the government. For NGOs around the globe, peer work has become a key role in harm reduction, facilitating one-on-one -on -one conversations about, about drug use from a place of lived experience, avoiding shame, guilt, or power disparities um, that leave out the autonomy of people who use drugs. Each person who uses drugs is an expert on their own use patterns and means, not healthcare providers who demand abstinence based on personal opinions instead of therapeutic recommendations. In drug checking services, service society organizations ensure that those providing personalized information to people who use drugs can do so in horizontal interactions that strengthen trust and promote honesty. Here we have a picture of our drug checking service, Checa Tu Sustancia, which is formulated and run by, um, as a health service from people who use drugs to people who use drugs. We, as a civil society organization, contribute to these changes through three main strategies. One, producing evidence based on human rights, on, on human rights sustain, sustainable development, pleasure management, and risk reduction. Two, advocating to promote public policies, framing social justice, and peace building. And three, 
joining networks with allies in the transformation of drug policies and cultivating a broad movement. And lastly, by transforming narratives, we mean focusing on people instead of substances, accepting that non-problematic and pleasurable drug use exists and its majority of users, recognizing that the war on drugs failed, stop underestimating people's intelligence, autonomy, and agency, and include people who use drugs in campaigns, outreach efforts, and the design of public policies. Thank you. that a um, couple of things I retain the idea how sort of the connectedness between sort of politics policies narratives and services and how policies narratives and services can be put at the service of life and rights um, and another thing that I retain from Dalel's presentation is like the very material impacts that these narratives and these um, laws have on people's lives um, and so uh, we're very privileged to have with us Gloria Miranda from uh, the Directorate for Drug Policy of the Ministry of Justice of Colombia, because a recent strategy by the, um, the recent uh, national drug strategy of the government of Colombia is precisely about life, about sowing life, which is an expression that I absolutely adore. So it would be fantastic to hear from Gloria about what the, um, what's the approach in relation to this issue of the government. Thank you, and thank you to Institute Doria for having me here. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as you said, Colombia's national drug policy is the first policy, drug policy in the world that recognizes openly the failure of the war on drugs. So we as a government understand that the war, rather than against drugs, must be against poverty, exclusion, inequality, and violence. So this policy was the result of a broad process of dialogue and participation from civil society, especially from the communities of the country, of the territories that has been most affected by the war on drugs and by the illicit drug trafficking. Uh, today, they are at the center of the national drug policy that is titled Sowing Life. So if we think what means sowing life, uh, it's essentially like rethinking, rethinking the drug phenomenon and challenging stigmatizing narratives. Um, different myths and narratives have been generated around the drug phenomenon that, and that have translated into practices of stigmatization, criminalization, discrimination, and violence. So these have certainly undermined the rights of the groups mostly affected by illegal drug markets and by the war on drugs that, as I said before, they are now the, like the center of our drug policy. So this context has been very unfortunate for Colombia since all these stigmatizing narratives have translated into poor peasants, for example, who cultivate illicit crops for their subsistence or mother head of household who have who has had to distribute small amounts of drugs to feed their children, they have been labeled as criminals, as drug traffickers. So another example is people who use drugs. So they have suffered such a stigmatization through uh, terms as, as you said, Nuria, and as Paula said, drug addicts, junkies or derelict and this has been like um, accentuated by public discussion and some media strategies so uh, they have linked drug consumption with disease crime and violence without exception right um, and this is not supported by evidence. I think this is the worst part. And due to these uh, prejudices surrounding psychoactive substances consumption, I have like some mm, survey information. For example, 53 of Colombians do not want to have neighbors who use psychoactive substances. 
and in addition, exclusion and self-exclusion from consumers itself, from their rights to have a family, to have education, uh, to access work, to access health. Some of them prefer not to access to care treatment services because they prefer not to be uh, stigmatized. And the worst of all, I think, um, to close this broad context is that the stigmatizing narratives have perpetuated strategies that have been proven to be ineffective, such as prohibition. So um, the, I think the main example is increasing penalties uh, for carrying uh, small quantities of drugs. Uh, this has not protected rights. Um, this has not improved the quality of life of anyone. This has just like uh, continue to vulnerable the rights of people. So this is why the change of narratives is one of the like the axes of the drug policy of Colox. We have eight axes. One of them is change of narratives, because for us is simply we can't implement the other strategies if we do not change uh, narratives. So for example. If we as authorities of the government still see consumers as sick people or as criminals, we can have uh, drug policies based on public health. So a, a big example is that our Senate have rejected uh, for three or four, I don't remember, uh, consecutive times, the bill to regulate cannabis. Five, okay. <laughs> And also mayors in big cities or main cities have prohibited consumption of substances.